Good evening, everybody. This is Jeff J. Brown in beautiful Shenzhen, China, where we are awaiting a typhoon arriving from the South China Sea. Should be bracing and invigorating. In the meantime, I am proud to read to you all tonight an article that uh, I wrote exclusively for All China Review. They commissioned it uh, from me, and I was more than happy to write it. And the title of it is So-Called Communist China. Here we go. In the mid-1930s, China was being rent asunder by four competing sides. One was the Communist Red Army, headed by Mao Zedong, Another group was the Japanese fascists and their imperial army. A third was the Guomindang, nationalists, abbreviated KMT in English, and ruled by Chiang Kai-shek. The last group was all of the Western colonialists, imperialists of course, who flattered themselves with the lofty label of great powers. Things were not going as planned for the Western Empire. They were backing hell or high water Chiang Kai-shek, parenthetically, who loved to be called Generalissimo, but, but whom American officials mockingly called Peanut behind his back, end of parentheses, to become the eventual leader of post-war China. Their plan was to install Chiang as the puppet head of post-war China in the mold of Cuba's dictator Fulgencio Batista, under the usual phony banner of Western democracy. It was looking more and more desperate with each passing day. The Generalissimo led his forces much like Abraham Lincoln's General George McClellan, mostly sitting in the barracks and retreating when confronted by the enemy. When Peanut did fight, it was to try to destroy Mao and the Red Army instead of ridding China of the much-despised Japanese fascists. Lincoln eventually replaced McClellan with General Ambrose Burnside. Western colonialists could see no other option to Chiang since Mao was public enemy number one as the most feared commie. But news from China's communist strongholds were getting too much to ignore. For months, Zhou Enlai, who was post-liberation, the Communist Party of China's, uh, the, the abbreviation is CPC, the Communist Party of China's premier and foreign policy maven, <clears throat> had been telling the Americans that the Red Army would fight under their generalship alongside the KMT to defeat the Japanese. Generalissimo adamantly refused to cooperate with any communists, even though it was the right decision for China's best interests. Furthermore, the Reds were winning the war against both the Japanese and Chiang's listless gang, while reports of happy, healthy, productive, and motivated communist citizens were turning into a barrage. <clears throat> this compared to the KMT's press-ganged troops, who were dying in their tattered shoes from starvation, ill health, and neglect, thanks to their very own corrupt generals and officers in the fields. U.S. President Franklin D. Roosevelt and company finally relented in 1937, so a small contingent of officers and journalists was sent to see for itself. Edgar Snow was there, whose book, Red Star Over China, became an international bestseller that year. Much to their shock, it was all true. Everywhere the communists took control, opium addiction, gambling, organized crime, prostitution, feet binding, child slavery, homelessness, illiteracy, and starvation were eradicated. <clears throat> Red Army soldiers and citizens were smiling, industrious, positive, well-fed, and committed to the cause. It was clearly not propaganda and all manifestly real. From that point on, the Americans privately understood that their very corrupt, dissipated Generalissimo and his KMT did not stand a chance against Mao and his formidable Reds. But being a ferocious commie hater... Fascist Peanut was the only horse Western colonialists had to ride. The West was caught in a philosophical, transitive loop. Mao and the Reds are communist. 
communism is evil, therefore everything that Mao and the Reds do must be bad. And that was the rub, this massive cognitive dissonance. They're communists, so how can it be working so well for them? <clears throat> Unable to come to terms with their blind ideology, FDR, Washington, and the popular press simply could not bring themselves to say, quote, communists, end of quote. So Mao and company were dubbed, quote, the so-called communists, end of quote. Joseph Stalin helped shape this ledger demand of the tongue by telling wartime British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and Roosevelt that the Chinese were radishes, red on the outside but white below the surface, not real communists. Thus, the square peg of CPC reality was crammed into the round hole of Western denial. At least... The Occidental imperialists got one thing right. Not only did the CPC sweep Japan and the Western colonialists out of New China, but it chased the KMT all the way to Taiwan. <clears throat> this same kind of rigid anti-communist ideology is still going strong in the West as it tries, mostly badly and incorrectly, to understand the Chinese people's socio-cultural evolution and Baba Beijing's, my uh, name for the leadership, Baba Beijing's politico-economic management of the country. To Western mass media, politicians, movers and shakers, China is still so-called communist. It must be capitalist to be doing so well, right? Just as FDR and his generation were blinded by propaganda, today's Euroangloland, Euro and much of the rest of the world are still brainwashed. Evidence is beating Westerners over the head if they could just take their zealous blinkers off. Let's start with China's, China's National People's Constitution and Deng Xiaoping. Anti-communists love to fawn over Deng like he was some kind of crusading capitalist guru. Yet it was he who presided over the most recent rewriting of the National Constitution in 1982. China's Constitution is a powerful rebuke of capitalism and everything the West stands for. The Chinese Constitution proudly splashes the term communism or communist 15 times, socialism and socialist a whopping 123 times, Dialectical terms like class, struggle, mass, independence, labor, worker, working, peasant, exploitation, capitalism, ownership, proletariat, collective, cooperative, private, fight, struggle, democratic dictatorship, power, and feudal, are spelled out a total of 265 times. Marxism, Leninism, and Mao Zedong thought are cited 10 times, and revolution 12 times. <clears throat> Big government central planning vocabulary such as safeguard, protect, lead, reform, rural, urban, production, plan, economy, system, administration, rules, regulations, institution, enterprise, science, technology, modern, organization, manage, progress, agriculture, farm, land, industry, resources, education, central, and develop get cited a mind-boggling 703 times. The importance of the central government guiding the people to what is now being dubbed the Chinese dream is expressed in the words state and government being used 292 times. Defiant words aimed at standing up to and defeating the West like hegemony, imperialism, colonialism, combat, defend, army, military, security, aggression, Fight, sabotage, and provocation are flung like weapons a total of 85 times. 
Any doubts about who is the beneficiary of China's constitution are dispelled by the word public being used 143 times and people a mind-blowing 392 times. Western elitism be damned. The preamble succinctly encompasses China's 5,000-year civilization and then highlights its century of humiliation, starting with the Imperial West's organized crime drug cartel in 1940. One early section of the preamble proudly shouts, and I quote, After the founding of the People's Republic, China gradually achieved its transition from a new democratic to a socialist society. The socialist transformation of the private ownership of the means of production has been completed. The system of exploitation of man by man abolished and the socialist system established. The people's democratic dictatorship led by the working class and based on the alliance of workers and peasants, which is in essence the dictatorship of the proletariat, has been consolidated and developed. The Chinese people and the Chinese People's Liberation Army have defeated imperialist and hegemonist aggression, sabotage, and armed provocations, and have thereby safeguarded China's national independence and security, and strengthened its national defense. End of quote from the preamble. The preamble later closes with this giant martial art kick to the West's collective face. China consistently opposes imperialism, hegemony, and colonialism works to strengthen unity with the people of other countries, supports the oppressed nations and the developing countries in their just struggle to win and preserve national independence and develop their national economies, and strives to safeguard world peace and promote the cause of human progress. End of preamble. Has it sunk in yet? Care to read the CPC's constitution? Together, it and the People's Constitution are the backbone, the bedrock of Chinese governance and society, and Baba Beijing's ceaseless pursuit to maintain the heavenly mandate. Property market bubbles? What property? Private property for sure, but it's not real property. All real estate is 100% owned by the people of China. There is not one square meter of private land in the People's Republic. You can pay for up to a 70-year usage lease on a piece of land and develop it, but no one can buy the dirt. Private enterprise? It is thriving for sure, but is heavily concentrated in small and medium-sized enterprises, abbreviated SMEs, that complement and do not seriously compete with the state sectors of the economy. The private sector is especially the many millions of mom-and-pop and solo businesses that blanket the country. Free markets? There is not one private bank in China. They are all people-powered. The world's largest bank, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, abbreviated ICBC, is state-owned, of course, as well as three other global top ten banks. Number one, ICBC. Number five, China Construction Bank, abbreviated CCB. Number 9, Bank of China, abbreviated BOC, and number 10, Agricultural Bank of China, abbreviated ABC. Ditto all insurance companies, the Shanghai and Shenzhen stock and precious metals markets. Same goes for all major media outlets, especially television, radio, and print media, although everyone has heard about Beijing being the new Hollywood of the East, which is mostly private sector. Unfettered capitalism? Get out of here! Almost all major economic sectors in China are dominated by state-owned enterprises, all abbreviated SOEs. Everything from airlines, avionics, to aerospace, to chemical industries, from construction to maritime shipping to mining, from nuclear energy to petroleum to railways, 
from steel to commit to telecommunications to utilities, over 100 key sectors have a huge people-powered footprint. Many are some of the world's biggest corporations. Not only that, but they are, like the aforementioned state banks, very profitable and well-run, contrary to relentless Western propaganda. Privatization? You have to look beyond the deceptive headlines. Baba Beijing caps the sale of the of SOE stock to the public at 30%. Furthermore, there are strict controls on making sure someone doesn't try to control what's offered. The ownership of the shares has to be spread out. Most of these stocks are owned by Chinese citizens, called A shares, but some are on offer to foreigners, called B shares. Interestingly, more and more Chinese companies, including SOEs, are doing IPOs, initial public offerings, in Western stock markets as part of their 30%. Reforms? Ha, ha, ha. The joke's on you. Baba Beijing will never sell off the people's SOEs. It knows that the citizens' social harmony and economic stability are rooted in its ability to macromanage and long-term, their five-year, long-term plan the country's direction via the 100% ownership of all the real estate, Marxism's controlling the means of production, as well as the key industries and sectors. The CPC will continue to create wealth under the rubric of socialism with Chinese characteristics by borrowing some capitalist trappings, but it is only transitional. Deng Xiaoping said it many times, and it continues going unheard in the West, that the goal is to follow the Marxist economic path to a wealthy communist society. But that's not fair, you say. The playing field is not level. Well, too bad, Western capitalists. China's socioeconomic and geopolitical advances since 1949 can be directly attributed to its anti-imperial communist system of governance. You can see what you want to see in the Middle Kingdom, project your sacred, and some would say mythological, Western ideas onto Baba Beijing and the Chinese people, but it's still not so-called communism. It's communism, period. Shh, listen carefully, and you can hear the spirit of Deng Xiaoping whispering it in your ear. Goodbye.